Hello, and thank you for joining us for our online worship video. This video is recorded right before Trinity Sunday, so we are looking at the truth of the Trinity through this service. So we begin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Would you confess your sins with me uh, according to the words that will pop up on the screen? Because God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, by his authority, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The lesson that we will focus on for our sermon today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul concludes his letter to the Corinthians this way. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, friends and family, members of the Trinity Lutheran Church family, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm wondering how many of you watching there, watching at home or, or wherever you are, speak another language besides English. You might know that we at Trinity Lutheran Church are located in the Northeast of El Paso. And here in our beautiful city, in our wonderful community, you can meet a lot of people who know how to speak German. <laughs> That's right. We do have a lot of German speakers in the community of El Paso, but of course, we also have a lot of Spanish speakers in El Paso. You're aware that high schools are now teaching a lot more uh, second language classes. Even some middle schools are employing second languages uh, to their curriculum so that, us, so that our children, the next generation, can grow up speaking more than just English. And it's really a blessing. So to you linguistic students out there, to you students of language, I want to ask you a question. What verb for to know would you use in this sentence? I know what the what two plus two is. Did you think of it? Okay, so hang on to that one. But what verb for to know would you use in this sentence? I know my best friend as well as if we were twins. Did you think of it? Were they different or the same? Because the fact is, in a lot of other languages besides English, those two verbs would be different. It's a different concept in a lot of languages to know something in an intellectual way with your head and to know something by experience, by what you have uh, been through, by familiarity. It's one thing for me to know the recipe for a delicious pepperoni pizza. It's another thing for me to know that pizza is one of my favorite things to eat in the entire planet, right? One of them is head knowledge. The other one has more to do with the heart. You can know a trigonometric formula to solve for, I don't know, I'm not gonna pretend to know. Or you can know the, way to, the best way to get home from work. Those are different kinds of knowledge, aren't they? One is intellectual knowledge in your head. The other is 
familiarity. It is relationship. I know my son's name. I know what it is, probably because I gave it to him. But I also know my son. I'm familiar with him. I have a relationship with him. We Christians claim to know God. But which know are we talking about? Do we just tout a bunch of facts about God? Do we try to throw facts about God in front of other people and try to learn them up real good? Or do we know by experience, by familiarity, who God is? What would the Corinthians have said? Well, they certainly would have said that they know God. They certainly thought of themselves as religious and spiritual people. They thought of themselves as some of them, I'm sure, super Christians. They thought that they were so special, some of them did. To the point where a couple people stood up in the Corinthian congregation or came to the Corinthian congregation and they said to them, you know, the Apostle Paul, you know, your former pastor, your former apostle who taught you everything you know about Jesus Christ, everything he, he sold you before is a bunch of malarkey. Don't listen to what he shared with you. Listen to this new message that we're bringing. These people were, of course, false apostles. But since the Corinthians were so concerned with appearing Religious and, and spiritual, they went along with what the fa false apostles said. They were easily tricked into believing teachings that were not correct, that were not in line with the message of Christ crucified that Paul brought before them. The Corinthians were familiar with discord, with division, with problems in their relationships to one another. They were familiar with sin. And so the way that they were acting and the things that Paul had to write about in both 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians could lead us to ask, did they know God? Or did they just know about him? 2 Corinthians is an epistle written by Paul and his protege Timothy urging the Corinthians, trying to get the Corinthians back on track to knowing God, not just with their heads, but with their hearts, because it was affecting the way they related to one another. It was affecting the way they related to their apostle, to their pastor, Paul. It was affecting their relationships. And isn't that just a summary of the basic human problem? Since the beginning of time, since when Adam and Eve first took the fruit and disobeyed their holy God, there have been fundamental flaws and corruptions in the way we humans relate. We know that with our heads and by experience. And we Christians know a word for that. The word is called sin. Because when sin entered the world, so did corruption. So did the flaws in our relationships. So did Racism and discord and division of all kinds. So did hatred of any kind, rage and anger of any kind. We know that with our heads. We know that that's a fact. And we know it by experience. Because we experience sin and we commit sin every day. And what are the ways that the sin shows up? It shows up in the way we relate to one another. Within the walls of this church that I'm sitting in right now, and outside of it, in our communities, in our families, and in our friendships, the way we relate to one another is fundamentally flawed. It's corrupted because of sin. Because of sin, we not only disagree with people of opposing perspectives and views, we disagree violently. We disagree vehemently. We attack people on the basis of their personhood when we disagree with their perspective. Because of sin, we can no longer hold it in when we dislike something about somebody else. We have to express it. Either we express it to their face or we hold on to it until we get home later and then we can express it to somebody else. We just have to tell about the things we dislike about people. We can't just smooth it over and move on. Because of sin, we are quick to sin. Quick 
to fold in front of temptation, quick to run after things that to, to indulge the desires of our own sinful flesh. Because of sin, the way we relate to one another is flawed. And that's to say nothing about the way we relate to God. Because what do we know about God? We know that he is holy, that he is powerful, that he has authority to punish sin, that he hates it. We know that God hates racism. We know that God detests gossip. We know that God dislikes it, to, to put it mildly, whenever we sow seeds of discord, whenever we react in anger to another neighbor, because we know what God's will is. God's will is that we would live in peace with one another and in love to our neighbor. So when we don't, we know God doesn't like that. We know that a holy, just God punishes sin. So we know that because of our sin, that's exactly what we deserve. Punishment. We know that there's no way we could look forward to relationship with God, unity with God, or familiarity with God. We know that there's no reason we should call upon God as if we, we were buddies with him. No, there's this rift between us because of the sin and corruption of our own hearts. We know that with our heads and by experience. What else do we know about God? Well, God has revealed quite a few things about himself in this, the Bible, his revealed word. You see, the Bible contains a lot of different types of literature. The Bible contains stories, true stories. It contains poems, music, lyrics, and prophecy. It contains a lot of things, and not all those things are descriptions of God or like a textbook, like you would open it up and just see definitions of words leading you in knowing who God is. No, but all everything in this book has to do with God, certainly. And we learn about God from this book. We learn that he is holy. We learn what his will for us is. We learn about how far, far short of his will we have fallen. We learn that God is a God of relationship. God is a God of relationship. That's how that's why he cares so much about how we relate to one another. That's why he cares so much about how we relate to him. We learn on the pages of scripture that God is a God of relationship. And one of the ways that we learn about it is in the way he chooses to reveal himself to us. God is very clear that he is one. He is just one God. He's not multiple gods. He's not three or five or a hundred. He's just one. But he reveals to us that he is three persons. That's what the Trinity means. The, the festival that we're celebrating this weekend, and the name of our church here in the northeast of El Paso. It's Trinity. Because when we look at the Trinity, we see that God is a God of relationship. God is God the Father. Present at creation, he created the universe using the power of his word it recorded for us in Genesis 1. God is God the Son, also present at creation. He is God as well. These aren't two gods, it's just one. But... God the Son came to earth and was our Savior. That he is God the Spirit, also present at creation, also fully God, and, and around since the beginning of time, who works among his church to this day. God is a God of relationship. One God, but three persons. In relationship with each other. In love and order and wisdom. And that's the Trinity. And that's about where my ability to explain the Trinity ends. Because this profound truth, one God and three persons, is not something that our, human, our puny human minds can grasp easily. But that's not where, it end, where the, what the Trinity has to do with you ends. The 
comfort of the Trinity goes deeper. Because God is a God of relationships. Here we were, this rift was dividing us between God, between was dividing between us and God, a rift that we caused because of the corruption of our own sin. But God is a God of relationships. So God the Father, who relates to and loves God the Son, out of his love, gave him up. Sent him to earth to be born of a human woman, a virgin named Mary, so that he could live, so that he could die, so that he could rise, to be a sacrifice for your sin, to forgive you for not loving your neighbor, for not loving God, to repair the rift between us and God to bring us back into relationship with him, to cover over our sin, to make atonement for us, to show us his love that we don't deserve, that we don't earn. But God's a God of relationship. So he did what it took to repair your relationship with him. And he sent to you the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, into your heart to create faith, to create trust, to connect you to the promise that the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, Jesus Christ, won for you with his life and death and resurrection. He gave you faith as a security deposit so that you know that that promise is true for you. God is a God of relationship, a relationship of undeserved love given and poured out for you. This is a one-sided relationship because there was nothing you and I earned or deserved out of God from his love. He simply gives it. And so now, now that we are dearly loved, now that we are bought back into God's family, now that we are forgiven, now that we are made his children through faith, now that we have relationship with God, we don't just know about him. We know him. We are not just filled through faith with a head full of facts about God. But our hearts are filled with familiarity with God. We experience God's love. We know by experience who God is. We know that he is listening to us. When we pray out in anguish, when we cry out to him, when we come before him, he is listening to us like a dad, listening to the incoherent babblings of a two-year-old. We know that God has a relationship with us. So we don't just know about him. We really know him. What does that mean then? What's the next step? What's our purpose now as ones who are dearly loved and known by God? How does this affect the way we relate to one another? That's where our text comes in. Because Paul says, as he concludes to the end, as he concludes his second epistle to the Corinthians, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Make no mistake, brothers and sisters, this is not an if-then formula. Paul is not telling the Corinthians, if you strive for res restoration, if you live in peace, if you agree with one another, then the Lord God will be with you. No, this is both and. Because the God of relationship dwells among you through his word and through faith, because the God of love and peace is with you, then all these things are possible. Then you can be restored, you and someone else at church. Then you are able to live at peace with others. Then you are able to encourage one another and live with, and to be as one mind. See, when we are aware of our relationship to God, repaired by Jesus Christ, we are prepared. To love one another. Yes, even the ones that we disagree with. 
even the ones whose perspectives are vastly different from ours, we are prepared by the God of love and peace to love, to practice empathy, to listen, to hear someone out even if their background is wildly different than our own, to sow seeds of peace, to call a brother or sister out on their sin, but when they repent, to restore them and encourage them just as Christ's message of reconciliation to God has restored and encouraged us. To extend to everyone the peace of God by sharing with them the God of relationship. With the people inside these walls at church and outside. To be lights to our community. Does it sound like a tall order? Or re realize you are not alone. You are not alone because the triune God, the God of relationship, dwells among you. He lives within your heart through his Holy Spirit, through faith. And you are not alone because you dwell and rest as a part of this greater group of brothers and sisters in faith. As Paul demonstrates in the next verse. He says, greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greeting. Can Paul be serious? Is this the sermon we need to hear right now, giving each other a holy kiss during Corona times? What about social distancing? What about personal space? Even if Corona wasn't going on, I'm pretty sure that if we instituted the holy kiss here at church, uh, there would be some backlash, and I think I understand why. Because kissing in our modern day culture is reserved for only the closest of close relationships. You don't just kiss anybody, right? And in Paul's day, it was a greeting. Like our handshake, or a hug, or even just a big smile when you watch somebody walk in the door. It's a greeting that means, I'm glad you're here. I respect you. I love you. You belong here. You are welcome here. You are my family. That's what a greeting like this means. That's the greeting we extend to one another because we look each other in the eye and we say, you're the one I relate to. You are my fellow believer. You are a co-member with me in the family of God. Because Paul includes us in the community of people he calls God's people. We are God's people. God relates to us. We are his holy ones, his saints. God has made us holy. Paul frequently talks like this in his epistles. He talks about the holiness of God like a garment, like something you wear. So that when somebody does come to church, no matter what differences you have, no matter what differences in perspective or opinion or appearance you have, you know that this is someone else who Christ has died for. Someone else who is clothed with the holiness of Christ through faith in Jesus, wrought by the Holy Spirit. You know this is someone else that God relates to, that God created, that he loves, and that he has saved. That's all true for you. It's true for everyone you worship with. How do we relate to one another? We sow seeds of peace. We strive for full restoration. We act as one, one mind. How is this possible? What's our encouragement? Well, I'll leave you with the encouragement Paul ends his letter with. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we flawed and sinful human beings, we do not deserve to relate to you or to come to you, but you have done everything necessary to purchase us back from our sin, to redeem us, to forgive us, and to make us your own. We thank you. We love you, and we are thankful that you have a relationship with you 
We thank you that you have sanctified our relationships with one another. That because you are triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we know that we are created by you, that we are redeemed by you, and that we are sanctified by you. We are enabled by you to live in love and restoration, to encourage one another, and to esteem one another, to respect one another. Thank you for bringing us into this knowledge of you that's not just head knowledge, but heart knowledge. Thank you for bringing us into a relationship of familiarity with you, that we have experienced your love ourselves. Help us to share your love, Lord, with those who know you and those who don't, with those in the walls of the church and those outside, so that more and more can come into relationship with your love and with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for our online worship service. Please fill out a comment card. The link should be in the description of the video below. We would very much appreciate you taking the time so that we can serve you better and others. God bless you.